Welcome to Champion Minded, the podcast for those who aim for excellence, not only in the sports arena, but in life. My name is Alistair McCaw, author, speaker, mindset and performance coach, and my goal is to help you unleash your unlimited potential and provide you with the tools to achieve greatness. Are you ready to become Champion Minded? Then let's do this. Hey everyone, welcome to the Champion Minded Podcast, or welcome back to it. I'm Alistair McCaw, your host. In this episode of What It Takes, I have Dr. Duncan French, the Vice President of Performance at the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas. But before I get into this episode with Dr. Duncan French, I want to just give a massive thanks to all of you who have left a review on YouTube or on iTunes for the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. Also, for sharing on social media, thanks so much for your messages on Twitter, on Instagram, all these things, guys. I really appreciate it. I value your feedback. And again, thanks so much for the effort. Also, some of you might already know that I do have a free online course that I brought out last week. It's my 10 Rules of Success. If you're all about self-improvement, self-leadership, and investing in yourself, this is one course you can't miss out on. Again, it's free, guys. And all you need to do is just head over to my webpage, alistairmccord.com, go to the menu and press courses, and it will take you straight to that link. But moving on to this episode of What It Takes, I have Dr. Duncan French, as I mentioned, the Vice President of Performance at the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas. Last year, I had the pleasure of actually meeting Duncan when I was at the Rugby World Sevens in Las Vegas. And uh, Duncan was so kind to take some time out of his busy schedule to show me around the facility and explain the culture and how things operate at their facility there. An amazing, an amazing facility. I must admit, high tech, cutting edge, and uh, they have some of the best people in the industry working there right now. A little bit about Dr. Duncan French. He has over 20 years experience of working with elite professional and Olympic athletes. Prior to joining the UFC, French was the Director of Performance Science at the University of Notre Dame in USA. Before residing to the United States, French was a technical lead for strength and conditioning at the English Institute of Sport. He has worked three full Olympic cycles and has been the national lead for strength and conditioning to both Great Britain basketball and more recently Great Britain taekwondo's Olympic program. As a strength and conditioning coach, Uh, Duncan has coached coached a host of Olympic, World Championship and Commonwealth Games medalists as well as world record holders from a variety of different sports. For three seasons, Duncan served as the head of strength and conditioning at Newcastle United Football Club in the Barclays English Premier League. French has authored or co-authored 60 peer-reviewed scientific manuscripts and seven book chapters. He currently serves as an editorial member for the uh, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. So pretty obvious to tell a man with a wealth of experience and knowledge. But in this episode with Duncan, uh, he goes into a little bit about his background. Uh, We discuss what makes a great coach. We speak about the culture within the UFC, uh, some of the things, uh, some of the standards, some of the values, um, how he prepares a fighter. We also talk about Conor McGregor. Obviously, Connor trains at the facility sometimes. What he's picked up in some of the most successful athletes and clients that he's worked with, and uh, and so much more. So I know you guys are going to enjoy this one. Please remember to leave your comments, leave your reviews. I always appreciate those. And without further ado, this is Duncan French. Hey, Duncan, welcome to the Champion Minded Podcast. Hey, how are you going? Thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Now, first of all, just wanted to ask you, how are things there in Las Vegas with uh, the COVID-19 situation? Yeah, I mean, for everybody, it's been a, a unique situation, right? Um, we, we've had our facility closed for close to 10 weeks now here at the Performance Institute. Um, so that's been interesting. Um, we actually reopened kind of full operations again on Tuesday of this week. Um, so that's, uh, again, lots of new policies and procedures as we try to you know navigate around logistical issues of hygiene and disinfecting and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been interesting because, you know, you take a really 
really close knit team that interacts with athletes on a day to day basis, and you, you know, you basically disrupt that whole infrastructure. Um, you do a lot more work remotely, and and as we all know, remote coaching is is a real challenge. And then uh, you know, managing athlete psychologies and and keeping them online on track has been uh, has been a, a management task for sure. But um, yeah, we're excited to be back, and the UFC was the kind of first major sport to be back up and running and um, you know we're proud of that we uh, we took the first step and um, yeah it, it, it's been a huge success touch wood to date so um, you know events uh, are going to continue to move forwards with the UFC so uh, we're excited. Excellent so if I get it right nobody's none of the athletes are back at the facility yet right? No they are now. Oh, so they are. This, week, this week from this week onwards yeah we're starting to bring athletes back athletes that are on fight cards for up and coming uh, events um, so we've got events for the next five weekends and um, those athletes on those fight cards will be coming into Performance Institute to use our services um, but also fighters that are not necessarily booked so we're having to manage kind of creating two different bubbles one for you know protecting those athletes that are on our events to making sure there's no cross contamination or risk to those guys um, but then also starting to ramp up our normal day to day operations for the fighters that just need uh, you know training spaces medical services coaching etc yeah and obviously i was there last year and and you obviously gave me a great tour of the facility and it's it's obviously massive it's what three stories isn't it two or three stories uh, it's two two, two, stories, two stories yeah, yeah. So we're about uh, thirty five thousand square foot here in vegas yeah yeah massive now uh, there's obviously some restrictions in place right now with, with the COVID-19. Is there still type of social distancing? Is there still uh, only amount of, so many people allowed in the facility right now? Yes, uh, and you know I'm speaking to a lot of other professional sports leagues and teams. You know we're all faced with the same issue of how do we, you know, how do we execute you know normal training environments with things like social distancing and making sure air quality and <clears throat> hygiene is right, and you know equipment and personal protective equipment and and creating kind of barriers of protection. So. Yeah, temperature tests and questionnaires on entry and all, you know all the all the type of stuff that everyone's doing. But it's a unique environment for our coaches and our therapists, obviously, um, having to you know create you know distance and, and and zoning out different parts of the weight room or whatever it may be, or you know the the way that the clinic and the treatment spaces are organised. It's it's just behavioural impact largely. Um, and yes, of course, initially it's seen as uh, a hassle and and. An, you know, an impact on people's day-to-day behavior. But, um, you know, I think some of those things are obviously going to stick for the foreseeable future. Um, And I think with time, as, you know, hopefully a vaccine comes around, we'll be able to loosen some of those policies. But, um, you know, people don't like, people have habits and and behavioral change is one of the most difficult things to manage. Yeah, well, obviously what I can remember from being in your facility was that it was already spotless. I mean, you know, especially for a, you know, a a training facility and so on and so forth, it was, it was, you know, just immaculate so to say but um obviously ufc is a massive brand probably one of the biggest in in world sports uh culture is obviously attached to that and one thing that i noticed when i was at your facility was that you know your culture is very very um very very evident of high standards you know obviously you have you know slogans on the walls but obviously this something that appealed to me is that the staff when i was there uh from waiting in the reception room was friendly and, you know, I always say a culture is, um, you know, starts at the front door, the person at the front door that's greeting you, the, the conversation you have while waiting for, you know, waiting for your thing. So tell us a little bit more about the culture there within the UFC at the facility, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah, I, I, I'm, a pre- I'm pleased that you, you, you had that experience and that was the feeling that you kind of found because, you know, we do pride ourselves on our culture and, and you know, everyone talks about culture and, you know, whether it's Jim Kerr and, you know, Legacy and the All Blacks book and what people took from that, you know, in business and, and particularly in sports business, you know, culture is, is massive. So here at the Performance Institute, we really work hard. We consciously target it. Um, and yeah, the operations team is as much a part of our performance team, you know, as anybody. So um, we, we really pride ourselves on an athlete centric model. Um, and that means the the the, um, the process of the athlete's movement through our facility has to be um, best in class at every stage. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's making sure that everyone understands that and everyone is a selfless kind of mentality, putting others first, trying to make someone else's day easier rather than harder. Um, you know, it's it's what we're about. It's it's a true team environment. Um, 
but again, it comes back to making sure that our athletes, who are our asset, um, and, and you know, it's, it's asset management, it's managing talent. Let's say, have the best experience that they can have in their training environment, in the relaxation areas, in the recovery areas, etc. So, you know, we do we do purposely think about that, and I'm pleased that you kind of had that experience. It's it's key to our mantra. Yeah, definitely, it was one of the main takeaways I, I, I took from there, and obviously meeting you for the first time there as well. I was just so impressed of how welcoming you were and how, you know, how much time you gave me as well. So, you know, that, that left an impression on me for sure. Um, you know, I was actually listening to, to one of your podcasts, doing a little bit of homework on you. And, no, right. and, and, you know, I can remember you, you know, giving, I think, one of the younger coaches advice of, you know, uh, you know more, li- more or less on the lines of people remember how you made them feel. You know, mm-hmm. you know, we get so caught up, especially in my, my younger career of learning the X's and O's and more drills and more exercises. And you thought that's what it was all about. The, the more smarter I am, the more knowledge I have, uh, the better coach I'm going to be. And obviously, as you know, age on a little bit, you realize it's all about relationships. It's about, all about how you make people feel. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I always say we work in a people industry, not in a sports industry. Um, and it's a flippant way of saying it. But yeah, people don't care what you know. People care about how, they, how you make them feel. Um, and then once they have that relationship and that trust and you've opened the door and built those kind of connections, then they start to really care about what you know. But, you know, we're human beings and, and, and we're, uh, we're social, social animals. Um, and I think understanding kind of social interactions and making people feel valued um, is, is critical. Um, and whether it's a coach you're talking to or whether it's an athlete you're talking to or whether it's another team member on our staff, you know, that all comes down to personal interactions, characteristics, you know, behaviors um, and, and, you know, really the emotional side of what we're doing, which often gets, as you say, overlooked because um, we get stuck in success and driving, you know, the, 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 the drive to be a world champion and the X's and O's um, and reality is, you know, it comes down to, you know, the, the environment and, and environments shape behaviors. And if we have a positive environment, um, that's going to subconsciously shape behavior. So um, that comes down to how people feel in an environment. Are they comfortable? Are they relaxed? Do they feel it's a place they want to be? So that's critical to, to my philosophy and our philosophy here at the Performance Institute. Now, I had, a, I had a structure here of how this uh, podcast was going to go. It's been completely thrown around uh, <laughs> because, you know, you've just brought up some great, great, and this is what I say, you know, it's like having a plan for your athlete and it, you wake up in the morning, you look at them in the eyes and you, and you say to yourself, okay, this, is, this isn't going to happen today, you know what I mean? Or this is, this is going to change or your athlete comes to you and says, oh, I'm feeling my knee a little bit from yesterday or my hip and that you had a, you know, maybe a a plyo session planned or you had a, you know, whatever it may be, and that plan is out the window. So that's how I feel right now is that the script <laughs> has been flipped because I want to go into, you know, obviously the impression you made on me and, and, and what you were, that advice you were giving that young coach on, it's about relationships, it's about connection, it's about how you make people feel. If you could give um, two or three other tips to young coaches, young trainers coming into the industry, Obviously, I'd love to be in the position you're in or, you know, at a, at a football club or, you know, you know how it is. What advice would that be? Yeah, uh, th- I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I've been very blessed with the positions I've held and obviously I've worked hard and, to do that. But, you know, uh, t- key values to me and key factors that I identify with, with my career development, which, you know, I'm happy to share. But, you know, I've always tried to be very authentic um i've I've never tried to be you know a, a white noise guy you know we're in an industry where there's a lot of white noise on on social media channels and things like that i, I just do what i do you know and, and i try to be you know a good humble person you know i think you know even in the privileged position that i'm in right now which i truly value i'm very humbled by it and um you know i i, I try to be authentic i try to you know, be be me and, and, and not, you know, not not try and shroud it with, you know, the coach badge too much um, and, or the, you know, the, the VP of performance badge. It's like, I'm Duncan, you know, I'm the same as you. It's, uh, we're just people and I want you to know me. Um, so at every stage of my career, I've always tried to be super authentic, just be myself, not try to force the issue too much because I think people figure you out if you're putting on a show and you're putting on an act and then I, f- I find that can become problematic and you know I tried that in my earlier not tried it but you know you try to conform to a certain scenario or stereotype in your younger career so be authentic 
um, be completely committed, um, which is a given. Um, but you know that you, you, I've sacrificed a lot, you know, in terms of time with family or time with friends or vacations or whatever, because I know I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. So I I I, I totally embraced it. You know, I, I I you know surrounded myself with every part of sports performance. So. You know, it's uh, you know the old Martina Navratilova thing. You know, it's who, the the ham and the egg sandwich. You know, who's committed, the chicken or the pig? And and you know, it's <laughs> it's it's one of those. You know, I I, I want to be the pig. I'm I'm committed, right? And I want to be involved. And I think you know, hard work and dedication. You, you can't get past that. Um, there's no ex. You know, there's, there's no easy route to success. You you've got to you've got to embrace the process. And you know, as Brene Brown says, you've got to embrace the suck. You, you you've got to get comfortable with just the 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 longitudinal approach to what a career is um so you know be authentic be truly committed um be inquisitive you know be be ask questions curious you know yeah be be never settle for and and I say this in a certain way, like never settle for the status quo. Uh, now, don't be a dick. Like, I don't want you to, like, every time I say something, you challenge him, well, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? You know, like, that, it, there's a way to be inquisitive and ask questions correctly and just speak to people without making it be an attack. You know, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to feel like I'm a pain in, a, a thorn in someone's side. Um, but I always want to, internalize things and question well why is that the right way for me to do it is is it the right way for another coach to do it is this the right environment or situation to do a, a certain technique or approach so yeah be be authentic be committed be inquisitive i think you know that's a if you get some of those going that's a great start do you think young coaches today or, or coaches in general don't reach out enough to to ask others you know for example i'll be very very honest with you one of the key the best things about my podcast is selfishly speaking i've been able to reach out to people like you and learn from you you know i'm right. obviously sharing it out there as well but you know i'm learning from from my guests i'm learning for you for example do you find coaches there's maybe maybe it's an ego thing maybe it's i don't want to show that i i don't know uh don't ask people like yourself enough questions you know maybe there's some new interns that come to your facility or whatever and they could ask more questions yeah, I mean, you've got to ask the right questions to begin with. But I think we live in an age where information is so readily available, right? And I think, um, you know, whether it be you know any digital channel, um, you, you can get you can get the answer in ten seconds, right? If I if I want to know something about a, a coaching philosophy or whatever, I can get to an answer very quickly and I think we live in a world now where things are expedited um, things happen fast and it's easy answers let's say um, and, and the process is done and I, you know that that's not the world that I was brought up in when I was you know starting my, my career um, and I think yeah just asking questions is is a huge skill now listen networking is you know it's it's difficult people don't you know again it, you, you don't like to put yourself out there you don't like to put yourself in a fragile position where people might say well why are you asking me that question or that's a silly question um, or hey I'm Duncan French can I speak to you even Do you know like I, I, can I give you a call and talk to you you know that that's hard for young up-and-coming professionals to do but I think you know you have to get over that kind of anxiety um, and yeah just communication as I say through through you know, speaking to people and, and again coming back to that human to human interaction don't you know professional development is not on social media right be around experts be around people get the nuance to what they're saying rather than the 140 character version on twitter or whatever it may be you know i think um, that's a key kind of mentality that i would hope people can adopt hmm. now i don't know who, who it was I, I was chatting to maybe about a year ago it was either mike friday the, the head coach of the the usa rugby sevens or um, mike boyle i can't remember who it was definitely a mike so that, <laughs> that, that, that cuts it down to a few. Now it's down to a few million people. Yeah, exactly, especially in the sports <laughs> industry. And one of the things that stood out for them, because we were obviously having a chat about you, probably your ears were burning that day, but 
um, was that they said, you know, Duncan is an incredibly smart guy, but one thing that really impressed me about him is his ability to adapt to the person in front of him. So, you know, if you're speaking to, I'm going to put this in inverted commas, another smart guy, you're speaking their language, they'll, you'll understand, they know your terminology. You know, it's, I, always, I always compare it to speaking to somebody in IT or just, in fact, just before this call, I was speaking to my tax consultant and, you know, I'm saying to him, sorry, I don't know what an I-94 is. Sorry, I don't know what a 224 form is. You know, and they think that you know. And, right. and one of the big impressions was is that you were able to adapt your language to the person you were speaking to. So someone that doesn't know anything about UFC, probably like myself, you're able to explain it well. How important is that for a, for a coach to, to understand? Yeah, I think it's massive. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of kind of Dale Carnegie and, and how to win friends and influence people. You know, I think that that 50-50 social interface is, is huge. People need to feel like they're taking something from their experience with you and it's a beneficial interaction. And you also need to feel like you're getting what you want from every interaction, you know. So well, that, that, that's kind of back in the 30s, but that still holds true today. Um, and, and listen, I, I, I kind of go back to my days as a, I, I did a lot of child acting I was a bit of a show off as a, as a kid right so my parents put me into an acting school right just to to channel my my you know eccentric ways but I actually hold that really dear to me my coaching skills now because the ability to role play or be a character I think is really crucial now you know, it's it's kind of a, a funny way to say it. You know, I was I was doing different kind of acting personalities, but that that kind of mentality I hold dear today. And you know, I need to be able to stand in front of a uh, you know an athlete and and purvey sincerity and you know knowledge and expertise. I also need to stand in front of a a sponsor and try and purvey the value of 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 kind of creating a relationship with us. I need to you know speak to a production person and 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 try and purvey what we're doing at the performance. Institute. So every kind of interaction is very different. And, um, you know, it's something, again, which I, I kind of pride myself on. But I think I, my acting training back in the day has helped me do that, you know. And, um, you know, role playing and character playing is certainly something which has been a, been a value to me. Mm. Now, this is a question I always hate to be asked. So I'm going to ask it to you. If Duncan could go back to the beginning of his career, let's say you started probably when you were 20, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Learn about them. What would you tell yourself? What lessons would you want to give yourself? Wow. Yeah, I mean, a <laughs> tough question on the spot. Um, cause, you know, I know what you're thinking right now. The, the questions I sent you, you know, last night, you're thinking, these are... <laughs> There's not one. The qu- there's exactly. There's not one question I saw on that piece of paper from him last night. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'll, you know, like Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a plan till they get exactly, punched in the face, exactly. right? But <laughs> no, I mean, um, I think you know, I would say know your position, um, and. I'm not saying know your position in terms of, oh, you're a sports scientist. You need to know everything about sports science. I'm saying know your position in the bigger ecosystem of where you are. Do you know what I mean? And, and you, you can't get ahead of yourself. You know, the, the, there's, a, there's a bravado and a gung-ho Duncan French back at 22, 24 years old who was like, right, I, you know, I can, you know, I'm going to dominate the world and, and do all these things. But, you know, you've got to understand your place in the bigger system. Do you know what I mean, I think interns, you know, that that's a, that's a key. Um, and, you know, if you, if, you know, first three years into a coaching role or a, a role or an organization, you know, you've just got to understand that there's a, there's a process to it. And you're, you know, you're, you're small fry in a, in a big, in a big pond. So, you know, I, I, I think now I always try to reflect on, you know, where I am, who, who, where I am in the bigger organizational system and the ecosystem that I involve myself. Sometimes I need to put myself right at the forefront front of it and other times I'm, I'm at the back of the line and I've got to be comfortable with that and again that's kind of an ego thing but you know you you got to be in a, be aware of where you are in the system now you obviously mentioned there you know a few books there obviously the Dale Carnegie one I mean it was what written in 1930 it's probably I think it's the yeah. second highest selling book after the bible right I mean, so you're reading so, so it obviously tells me that you invest a lot in yourself you read a lot um, in what ways do you invest in yourself and and second question uh, is there any books out there that you'd recommend to to any of us? 
Yeah, I mean, I read this, you know, in, in my role right now as a, as a performance director, I have to kind of have a, a, a pretty diverse kind of interest in, in learning um, everything from, you know, continuing to know what science and the latest training methods are telling us and, and being on point with kind of coaching and, and, and training techniques through to, all right, I've got a team of 30 odd people that I manage. I need to, you know, understand, you know, Psychosocial, yeah, leadership, psychosocial behaviors, you know, organizational infrastructure, everything in between. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I try to just take snippets and learn. I, the honesty is, I'm not the best reader, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm pretty slow reader, so I don't turn books around real quick. Well, but, well uh, let me, let me jump in there. Do you find this because I'm relating to you there is that I probably this year is the least I've read, uh, ashamedly, but you write a lot. I mean, you've written, you know, so many uh, theses and and books and so on and so forth. Right. Do, do you find that you don't feel like reading after a while because you've been you've been on the computer all day, probably writing yourself? I'm finding that this year a little bit more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that you know, there's writer's fatigue, and then it's just like uh, uh, I don't digest it. And and you know, a little secret for for the people out there. One thing which I do do. Um, is I, you know, I'll often accept speaking engagements for do presentations, or I'll write a book chapter, and I'll do it on something that I'm not, I don't consider something that I'm really good at or an expert. So that forces me to go and learn mm. it to then educate and teach others about it. So you know, people are saying, "Oh, I'm reading this book chapter that Duncan French has read. He's an expert." I might have just, <laughs> I might have read myself into that knowledge pretty, pretty early into that, you know. So. Um, that's one th- one technique that I've found over the years. I you know particularly with presentations at conferences and stuff. I, I try to say I'm going to speak on a topic area which I'm not super super confident on, and that forces me to learn something new. So that's a way that I've kind of kind of expedited learning methods. Get um, uncomfortable. Well, yeah, they say if you get the best way to learn something is to teach it to somebody else, right? Um, so that's certainly something that I do. You know, I'm reading this book, Peak, uh, by Mark Bubbs at the minute, which is a really great read, just looking at, you know, the sports performance and, you know, the new age of, of integrated services and things, which, again, is very topical to what I'm doing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, everything from, you know, Brene Brown and Simon Sinek and, and those types of things through to, you know, hard hard science and what are the latest science papers telling us. Mm. Um other ways that you invest in yourself now obviously you know when we chatted yesterday you just got in from a run so obviously exercise is an important part of your day um you know here's the thing the fact that you work in an exercise facility doesn't mean that you get to exercise you have to put time aside you know uh, because you're there to work for example you're there to be of service to others but you know you obviously you know keep yourself in shape um uh, podcasts anything like that as well yeah, I mean, keeping in shape. I, I'm, I read High Performance Habits, and um, you know that, that's Brendan, again Brendan Burchard, was it? Yeah, Brendan Burchard, which again talks about you know all the high performers take time to look after their health and well-being. Now, it, it, there was a time here not so long ago in the last kind of five years where I just kind of. I was trying to. We were trying to open up the Performance Institute, and um, you know, whatever it may be. I just moved to the states to Notre Dame, and then I came to the Performance Institute, and I was just working, 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 working at the expense of you know my health and my you know my my so my psychology and and uh, you know just happiness. So you know, I really tried to jump back into that. That's one thing that COVID allowed me to do. So a lot of people said, "Oh, you know, it's broken up my workout routine." For me, COVID was great because it gave me ten weeks straight of really structured days at home where I could work out in the garage I could you know run through the at some point through the day you know we've got a pool luckily and I could swim so you know I got got back into this mentality of you know I have to look after myself first for my family but then also for for the team and the people around me to give the best version of me um so yeah the you know the energy bank and 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 those types of things you know the human energy bank I'm really conscious of is is how you maintain that um I think you know I've learned you've got to step away from from what I do, you know, I, I talk about commitment, but there's, you absolutely have to refresh and step away. Duncan, do you find it hard to switch off? Yeah, I mean, it's something certainly which I've struggled with. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm I'm so engaged with what I do. Uh, you know, the COVID times here, my wife, you know, said for the first two weeks that I was at home, you know, I was driving her nuts because, uh, <laughs> you know, I've just, I, I'm so used to being in the work environment and then going home and being around that. And it's the same if I go on a vacation. You know, it takes me an, a, a week to uh, to actually start to relax and just decompress because I'm pretty tightly wired. Um, so, yeah, I've got to purposefully and consciously try to, 
figure ways to do that. You know, for me, being in the being by a beach, being by water is, is my kind of happy place. So you know, wherever I can do that is something which I try. Yeah, <laughs> the, the waves are crap in Florida. I right? got to go to the surf in California. That's uh, the problem. True, true. <laughs> but the beaches are better. So, absolutely. <laughs> um, excellent. Uh, what was my next question? I got completely thrown off by that vacation. My vacation one there. So, um, let's have a look here. Dealing with uh, obviously working with athletes in a in a high performance environment. Um, obviously, in my job, I get to visit you know a few professional teams and in, in high performance environments. How do you deal with the ego point of things? Because obviously, you know, world-class athletes, there is an element of ego sometimes too much because we know that confidence is, is, is attached to ego as well. So it's very important. Mm. Um, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, listen, I've worked in some sports with some huge egos from everywhere from kind of the English Premier League and millionaire soccer players through to, you know, Talk about having to have an ego in, in mixed martial arts and being a fighter and, you know, getting into an octagon and someone's trying to take your head off. You know, you need to have an ego, I guess, to some extent, or confidence, let's say. But, uh, I mean, listen, I, I always refer back to, you know, the Latin meaning of ego is, if you if you translate it directly, it means I. So, you know, the, the, the English version of, you know, the Latin ego is literally I. And I think that's kind of something which I've always kind of held conscious when i'm meeting working with athletes is you know it, it's an identity and ego is a it's a test of real of of the real world around us right so what athletes are trying to do is consciously test uh, their world their environment to see how they can position themselves in and in that world and give themselves self-worth and self-value so you know i think in in, in sports performance where it's about success and winning the, then all you're doing is magne- magnifying that kind of challenge to how I position myself as my identity and my value within the world that I operate in. So, you know, I think managing ego is is another skill. Again, it comes back to what I've said. We're, we're in a people industry. Um, I always say as a coach, I have to flex my style to accommodate um, or manage someone, the athlete, you know, and that includes their ego. Now, sometimes that's hard to do because you might think this guy's a, a dick, you know, um, but that's the reality of where they're at. That's their self-worth, their identity. You can't crush that because if you if you try and remove it and try and crush it and try to say, hey, drop the ego or whatever or put them in a position where their ego is challenged, that most likely will backfire because that that's related to their personal values. That's deep inside them. Um, so, you know, in, in our world of, of prize fighting where the promotion side of things is big, you know, there's a lot of bravado. There's a lot of bragging a lot of boasting a lot of you know jarring and trash talking 99 percent of the time behind that these people are great people you know and, and and wonderful people to be around but everyone has an ego to a certain level and i think again that's another skill of coaching is how how you number one identify someone's ego and where it sits and number two how you can then manage and accommodate it and if it's disruptive in a team environment which is a huge aspect. What what do we do to kind of avoid someone's craving for a personal identity, how that disrupts a team environment and team cohesiveness versus what I am now, an individual sport, and just managing someone's large ego and, and how I can get around it. So, you know, ego is a fascinating thing, but I think um, – it comes back to how we've got to accommodate it and see how disruptive or non-disruptive it is. This is a great segue to get into um, my next question, obviously about Conor McGregor. So we talk about ego there as well, but you know he backs it up. Um, he's been at your facility, obviously training a few times. What was that like? Um, you know, obviously you've got to to speak to the man himself, but um, you know, total professional, focused when he's when he's in the zone. Um, obviously the. Uh, you know his team and and the amount of publicity that he gets when he's training at the facility. What, what's give us a little bit of a an inside picture into that? Yeah, well, I mean I've got to be careful because Connor's legal team is way bigger than my legal team. So, um, but what, what I mean, listen, Connor's transcended mixed martial arts. Connor McGregor is a brand now. Do you know what I mean? Like Nike or Adidas. You know, it's like Connor McGregor is is a, a marketing machine, and he is you know I would say you know one of the best 
promoters in the world um, in terms of marketing and brand identity. So, you know, we, again, knowing that, Connor's a unicorn for our organization. Connor is um, very different. Uh, we can't look at supporting Connor or Connor's expectations in, in the same way as, as some of the other fighters. Um, if you talk to Connor one to one, you know, he's a great guy. He's, like I say, he's, we're all human beings, you know, we're all, we're all kind of social animals. He's, he's, he's very witty. He's sharp. He's fast. He, he wants to, he wants to be happy. He wants to have a great time. Um, he wants to tell jokes and laugh and, you know, things like that. Um, but he also is very astute at identifying that he's got a brand to promote and there's a financial implication of that and his partners. Um, so, you know, when it becomes a, an environment that he can market himself, he's going to maximize that potential and, and fair play to him. So I think he's really figured out the, you know, the business side of it, but on a humanistic side, you know, I've got a lot of time for Connor. He's, he's, he's a, you know, a great humble guy from kind of Dublin. Um, so yeah, it's it's a different kind of process, but when he's when he's zoned in for fight preparation, yeah, of course, like any fighter, he's uh, he's he's you know he'll, he'll go he'll go into the trenches and he'll do the work. So um, yeah, mm. a lot of time. Let's let's go into the preparation side of of you know when you work with an athlete. Obviously, when I was there last time at the um, at the facility, uh, I got to meet Henry uh, Suzero. Sorry, the Suhudo. 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 Sorry, my apologies. Yep. Yeah. Um, super humble guy, uh, you know, obviously a, a total professional as well. But what, take us through what it looks like when you're preparing a fighter for a fight. It, you know, when does that training start? How many weeks out? And what does it look like more towards, you know, f uh, the day of the fight? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing I will say is that one of the unique sides of, you know, prize fighting like the UFC um, or boxing, whatever it may be, is often um, after you've had a fight, you don't know when your next competition is going to be. So in tennis, for example, I know that I'm going to go to Wimbledon, then I'm going to go to, you know, some other event. I'm going to go to the Aussie, o well, Aussie Open, start the year, then I'm going to go to the American Open. Except, Wimbledon, except, except this year, 2020, we have no right. idea. <laughs> exactly. so it's, a little bit, it's a little bit like UFC. Right. So, you know, our guys don't know when the next fight is going to be until the UFC calls them up and books them for a fight. So there's a bit of a gray area, the transition time where you kind of essentially off camp or not doing competition preparation, where that's the time to work on developing some of your physical attributes and if, you know, the different factors that go into the skill and technical tactical side of things. Um, normally, guys have an eight week lead in to a fight. So, you know, there's the eight, eight to ten week fight camps are, are common. Um, but some fighters will take short notice fights anywhere from five weeks, sometimes even even you know shorter than that if they're in if in, they've been doing their prep well and they they can react pretty quickly and, and feel like they're comfortable to go into the octagon on a short notice fight. But normally it's about six to ten weeks, um, which is an on camp phase that we'll call you know competition phase. And uh, yeah, there's a there's a, a big obviously increase in intensity and volumes and obviously driving a tactical approach once they know who their opponent's going to be tactics and techniques become a big kind of conversation and supersede any physical attributes and that's again another side of our sport is uh, if I'm Man United and I know that I'm going to be playing Chelsea yeah Chelsea have a certain style of play but it's it's football right it's it's soccer you know what you're trying to do but in our sport I can get booked against a wrestler or I can get booked against a kickboxer and that's two very different strategies completely and a you know jiu-jitsu fighter where I'm going to be spending all the time on my back versus a striker like Conor McGregor where most of the time I'll be on my feet you know trading punches and kicks so you know tactically that's a massive decision to make in a pretty short period of time and then obviously fine tune your techniques uh, to accommodate it. So there's a lot of decisions that go into once they know who they're fighting, strategy and tactics come into their training structure a lot more. Now the week before a fight, what does that look like? Does the volume obviously come down? What are they, what are they working on in that week toward, uh, towards a fight? And also their diet, does that change mm -hmm. at all? Yeah, I mean, again, another unique side of our sport is we're a weight classification sport. So, you know, you have to make a certain weight to be able to uh, to compete, let's say. So, um, you know, the the last week is all about the weight, you know, making weight. Um, they'll they'll still work out usually. Um, you know, they'll they'll get you know different sweat on and do some high intensity 
you know, just just sort of feel fresh, they feel sharp, uh, do some mitt work, do some bag work, you know, do some um, you know coordinated drilling with uh, with some of their partner training partners. But you know, no sparring. All the sparring will be finished usually ten days to two weeks before the actual fight itself. Um, and then yeah, that last week is all about feeling sharp, feeling good about yourself, confidence, uh, and and making making the weight cut, uh, which is a unique part of what our sport has to entail. Now, obviously, I mean, within your career, like you said, you've worked at, you know, the English Premiership team, Newcastle United. You've worked with um, Great Britain Taekwondo. I mean, the list just goes on here, Notre Dame Athletics Department, so many, you know, different establishments and great athletes. What are some of the traits that you've picked up in, in some of the world's best performers? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a that's a really a really good question. Is like what what differentiates people? Um I, I always say it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's it's they've got to be compliant to long term development. Um, you know, they've got to adhere um, to a training program. Um, it's it's hard to, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of research out there. You know, talking about the eighty percent rule. You know, you got to you got to commit to eighty percent or more of your um, your training to number one minimize injury risk, but number two to develop potential. Um, so I think you know compliance and adherence, just embracing the training is is huge, uh, particularly at the highest level because you're going to be doing a lot of it. Um, you know the, the that just embracing again to steal phrase from Brene Brown is embracing the suck. You know, like training is not nice, and sometimes it's you know it needs to be enjoyable. I don't want to say it's fun. Fun it can be fun, but you know, fun's an F word, right? Whereas if it's a, an enjoyable process, just even when you're in dark, you know, in, in, in the dark side of training in the deep water, and it feels you know feels terrible. They've got to be comfortable dealing with that, you know. And I think that the top guys can do that again and again and again on a daily basis, Consistent, and really, yeah. right, put put themselves just in places where other people aren't willing to go. Um, and then, you know, another one is is I think the best athletes can turn things on and off. And again, that I, I like that. I, I like to see that because again, when you're talking about managing your energy levels, they need to be able to, you know, move from a, a sympathetic, you know, adrenaline charged, high intensity kind of mindset and physicality to actually that regeneration and, and, and recovery status. So I think the best guys have the capacity and the ability to create distraction. Um, they're not just sitting at home on the couch saying, oh, I have to go to the next practice. When is it? What's going to happen? I need to get, you know, th there needs to be a, a, a stringent commitment to kind of diet and, and regime. Um, but also they need distraction. And that, I think that's a crucial thing that some of the top guys do. You see them being able to switch off and, and, and decompress, let's say. So I think that's a, a really uh, a really important thing. And then, listen, the, the most given thing is that they all want to win. Uh, uh, Their the desire to succeed um, supersedes everything. It consumes them. Um, at, you know, the, the world champions, the, the best athletes, they are to a, you know, to a, to the nth degree are committed to success. And I think that, that that's an unwavering mindset of um, how they're going to succeed. Mm. Now, obviously, uh, trust is a big thing when working with an athlete. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the ways of obviously getting to connect to an athlete a lot more. What are some of the tips you could give us in, in building trust with a client or an athlete? Yeah, I mean, trust is key, right? And it comes back to what we said previously in the conversation. People, people don't care about what you know, what you've done, who yeah. you are. People care about how they make you feel. And you know, I, I can, I, I've had a great career, but no one cares if I've worked at these different teams. People care about what their interaction with me is at that moment in time when they walk through the door is Duncan someone I want to be around does he make me feel good does he make me feel happy do I feel energized by him or is this guy hmm, he's kind of a shady character I'm not sure I want to hang out with him he's got ulterior motives he's going to stitch me up etc etc so you know trust is the first thing you have to build you know it, it, it starts with a relationship and then trust comes from that relationship um now, again, I don't know that I've got any great tactics and ideas for you, but, again, it comes back to authentic authenticity for me. Um, I just try to 
be a, a a straight up welcoming guy, someone that you know. I like to have fun. I like to enjoy myself. I like to smile. I'd rather smile than be pissed off all the time. So you know, that's what I want to bring to my interaction and w- with the fighter. The once you've built trust and they can see that your efforts and your ambitions are aligned to their needs, that's a huge thing. Um, and that, you know, you, you've got to make that connection first of all, but then you've got to demonstrate your ability to show that you are, your, your efforts are selfless efforts in terms of I'm trying to support you at, at the sacrifice of my needs. And I think once once you can demonstrate that you're aligned to their goals and their ambitions, then trust really starts to come into it at a deep level. Mm. Now, obviously, you spoke about humor there in, in uh, a few sentences back. Um, a a, a um, survey I did with 118 athletes back in 2017 with college athletes, academy athletes, and you know a few pro athletes as well. As I asked them, I gave them 10 things to choose from. Uh, put them in order, what they looked for in a mentor, a coach, a trainer, for example. And uh, out of those 10 things, you know, you had uh, trainers who had experience, obviously trainers who had probably competed at a professional level, uh, very high technical skill, all these things. There was a few things. And in the top three was humor. Mm. And it was surprising. I mean, obviously, you know, but humor was one of those top three things in the top 10. And I think as coaches, you know, we like you just spoke about there, being authentic. We all have a sense of humor somewhere. Yeah. But, but, you know, obviously hard work is the most important thing to, to achieving success. But, you know, you can also have fun uh, working hard, right? Yeah. And I, look, look, I think, you know, the, the, they are the antith- antithesis of each other, which is why they go hand in hand. You know, like training can be hard and challenging and deprivating. Whereas humor is is a good time, so you need the yin and the yang, right? If you only ever sit in the the, the, the training domain and it's suppressing you more and more and more, that's that's not beneficial to anything. And you know, I I, I like to think I, I bring enjoyment and humor to my coaches' sessions and my my interaction with athletes and coaches. Um, Fuzz Khan is is one of the best guys I've ever seen at doing it in terms. Of, he's a high you know British high jump coach who's taken a lot of uh, uh, you know, Robbie Grabars and people like that to, um, you know, Olympic medals. Um, he is hilarious as a coach, but technically he is one of the most fine, like the d- most detail oriented coaches I've ever met. Knows it inside out, but his delivery is like hysterical, but he also knows when to switch it on and off. Um, and I've learned a lot from someone like him, uh, who, by the way, is a professional actor when he's not coaching. Um, oh, okay. But, yeah, but again, it's this role-playing thing, right? But um, I, I just think hum- humor and enjoyment and laughter is just energizing to anybody, you know, in, in, as as a, as a human. So I think it's, um, it's it doesn't surprise me that that came back as as you know what people look for. Obviously, I want to be respectful of your time because obviously things are back to normal there at, at yeah. um, USC there in Vegas. Um, uh, a few, just a few more questions. Who have been some influences in your career? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, start, it started with my dad, let's be honest. Like like most most young boys, my, my dad was a, a pretty good you know, high school and, and college athlete. Um, and, you know, just from a supportive, you know, from a support infrastructure and a support network at home, you know, he, he was he was fantastic. You know, my mum and my dad, they would take me all over the place uh, for different teams and different sports. And, um, you know, just super positive about my desire to play different sports and, and to show how I could, you know, use sport as a platform to go on tours or see see the country, see the world, see Europe. You know, that that, that was great. Um, and then kind of my first soccer coach was a real kind of um, – he, he, you know, he expected things at the highest level. I, I played for a soccer team that were um, very, very prolific in the area that I was from, and, and won uh, many different age groups, won, won multiple league titles, and um, you know, he was he was a really influence influential person on me. And then as I became older and older, you know, like who did I aspire to, or who kind of influenced me? People like Barry Sanders. And then, uh, uh, you know, from the NFL, but then a later date, you know, Jason Robinson. I, I aspired to these 
smaller guys that were competing in big man sports, let's say. Um, where uh, R- Robinson th- from rugby, England rugby, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Who's you know same age? He's pretty the same age as me. He, what right? what did he play? Fullback or a wing? He was uh, he played the wing primarily, and, and yeah. then he moved to fullback for the England World Cup team. So when the yeah, England won player. the World Cup, yeah. So I, you know, I just resonate because I'm not the biggest guy, right? Uh, but I feel like I've got uh, you know I've got a big man brain. Uh, you know, I think I'm bigger than I am, and that's you know that that's why I got into resistance training and, and sports performance training back in the day to say how could as a smaller guy how could I compete on the rugby field or in some of these other collision sports. So someone like Barry Sanders, just his pure athleticism, but also kind of, kind of a small guy, and not not performing on the best team, right? If Barry Sanders had been on any other team, he would have won multiple Super Bowls. But you know, he was playing for the Detroit Lions, and he was also committed to that team. You know, that that was his team. Um, so he sacrificed kind of his probably his success for an allegiance to a mission of a, of a team. So you know, those types of things really resonated with me, and I aspired to those. Um, kind of personalities. Excellent. All right. So, uh, final part of the um, of our conversation are a few fun questions. Uh, yeah. I I didn't give you any preparation for this, so this is oh, completely catching you by surprise. <laughs> so it's either one word or a sentence. It's it's up to you. Are yeah. you ready? Yeah. Favorite city. Uh, Barcelona. Okay. Uh, favorite male athlete and female athlete, past or present? I mean, I'd say Barry Sanders uh, for male. Um, female. Oh man, that's not no disrespect to the ladies. Um, I, I mean, I'll say Jade Jones simply because I worked with her. She's a double Olympic gold medalist in taekwondo. But again, she she's uh, she's hilarious. Um, she she enjoys herself, but she's um, super dedicated, hard work. Favorite sports team? Uh, I mean, I'm a Newcastle United fan, so I've got to say those guys. Magpies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a, a question there. Who, who was the manager when you were there? Uh, Chris Hooten and then Alan Pardew. Okay. And I see Alan Pardew's in in uh, Netherlands now, working with Ado Den Haag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he went over to the, ne- the the Dutch league. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, Heat, probably. Or yes. Dumb, or Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> hey, we're we're on the same track there, man. All um, right. <laughs> yeah, me me. Uh, you know, Scarface, Heat, and uh, Dumb and Dumber, just good old classics, man. But uh, yeah. Heat, uh, I can watch that over and over. It's classic. Uh, yeah, Pacino, De Niro, uh, Kilmer. Uh, yeah. Favorite food? Uh, I mean, for me, I can't be spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite drink? Uh, I mean... Not Newcastle Brown Ale, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Supporting... Maybe back, maybe back in the day. Uh, I mean, I like uh, apple juice. I don't drink any hot drinks. That's a, a fun fact about me is I don't drink tea or coffee. Um, I don't drink soup or eat. Do you eat or drink soup? I don't know what you do oh, with soup. It depends what soup it is. You can get some soups that you do have to eat. So, right. uh, I mean, what is stew? Is stew? I mean, I don't know. Stew yeah. could be a soup as well. Uh, so a that, podcast. That, yeah, exactly. So that, that scraps my next question, tea or coffee, so we don't have to uh, ask that one. Uh, favorite book? Um. I mean, I let's say uh, let's say um, science of resistance training by um, Zatsiorsky. Okay. Boring, uh, I know, but it's it's it's, uh, it's a uh, it's a classic. Okay. Oh, it appeals to you. That's that's important. Um, favorite musician. Uh, God rest his soul, Avicii. Ah, uh, beach or mountains? Beach every time. I have no <laughs> idea why people walk up mountains to then just walk back down again. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it makes no sense to me. Yeah, so beach, beach every time. Red hot chili peppers or the Backstreet Boys? <laughs> chili pepper. <laughs> uh, person that you'd like to have lunch with the most, past or present? Uh, I mean, listen, the you know the last dance is on at the minute. Michael Jordan to have dinner with Michael Jordan, I'm sure, will be fascinating just to get inside his mind. He's had such a career. 
Um, so I'm sure it'd be fun. Yeah, what an impact that uh, that series has made, huh? Yeah, it's uh, it's been uh, it's really 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 eye opening to get that behind the scenes look at kind of the whole season. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, man, this has been a great conversation. I mean, uh, I've really enjoyed this, and I'm sure our listeners will will too. So, uh, final question before we get to uh, where how people can reach you. Um, in your opinion, what does it take to be champion minded? And again, that can just be a sentence or a few words. Um, yeah, a an uh, an unparalleled level of never being satisfied. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I, just you know, that never be comfortable with the status quo. <laughs> You know, I was having a chat with uh, Josh Taylor, who, who's a, a Scottish boxer, um, you know, when I was in, back in Scotland in February. And he said, you know, there's, there's just no finish line. Yeah. There's no finish line to how good you can be. Right. And, yeah. you know, one of the interesting things that he said in our conversation was, you know, I asked him what motivated him. He said, it's knowing that my opponents are out there training and I, I'm, I'm going to out-train them. I'm going to outwork mm. them. You know, it's just, mm. uh, just the mind of, a, mind of a champion, which is very, very interesting. That's um, awesome. Now, I know you're a very private guy. Is there any way uh, some people can follow you out there? Do you have a, a Twitter handle or anything? Yeah, no, I mean, listen, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not the most prolific on social media, but it's not that I'm not on it. I'm on, you know, Dr. Duncan French, uh, Dr. underscore Duncan underscore French on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so, you know, DM me on that, no problem. I'm on LinkedIn, um, just as Duncan French. Um, so people can find me for sure. Great stuff. Duncan, thanks so much for taking the time. I mean, this has been awesome, and uh, I'll let you get back to it. Yeah, thanks, Alan. I, 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 I mean, I appreciate it. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity. So there you have it, guys. Another episode in the bag. A big thanks to Dr. Duncan French for coming on the show. Remember, this podcast is available on iTunes and on YouTube. Connect with me on social media on Twitter, at Alistair McCall, on Facebook, Alistair McCall page, and on Instagram, Be Champion Minded. As always, remember you were made for greatness. Now go do the work. Stay champion minded.